Hello, good afternoon. It's one o'clock here on the East Coast. I am Paul Merrill, I'm your host for today's conversation about the future of testing leadership with Megan Thompson. I'm very excited for this. Megan is uh, an active participant in the testing community. She is up in Calgary and works with, uh, works with At Venue, and I'm very excited to have her here talking about the future of test leadership. If you don't know me, if you don't know Beaufort Fairmont, I am the, the CEO, the founder of Beaufort Fairmont. We focus on test automation. We eat, sleep, live, and breathe test automation. This is what we do. We love helping companies sync up testing and development in agile environments. We love working with companies to implement test automation within DevOps cultures, and we like implementing practices that work well within your context. Uh, we take a agnostic approach to tools. We work with the tools that make the most sense for our customers. We don't sell tools, we sell services. And those are consulting, training, and uh, helping you find people for your jobs. So we have a set of experts, dedicated experts for test automation. And if you need those in the United States, we're happy to help you out with that. Give us a call anytime. So like I said, looking forward to Megan today on the future of testing leadership, and I'm so glad you're here. So, a couple things upcoming. Hopefully you can see my screen okay and everything's doing fine here. If not, you're welcome to chat with me um, in the questions or in the chat or whatever. But I usually give some upcoming dates. The next webinar is gonna be Nancy Kellen. She's a friend of mine. I've known her over the years. She tends to show up at STPCon a lot and at other conferences, and that's where I met her. She did a keynote very similar to what she's going to do with us next month. So mark your calendars for the 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Nancy will talk about qualitative risk-based reporting, which is awesome. So uh, looking forward to Nancy being here and looking forward to you joining us for that. I want to mention if you're local, there's a TISCA meetup in January that I'm going to be speaking at. I'm working on a talk it's one of my, uh, my a brand new talk, and I'm actually going to use it for a keynote, my first keynote. I'm very excited to have that coming up in the spring. So I'll be working through that talk. Join me in January in Durham for the TISCA meetup where I'll be practicing that keynote and looking for your feedback. TISCA, the conference, TISCA 2020 is in Durham in February, and it'll be $149 for the session day. It's a wonderful conference. We had over 500 folks uh, a couple years ago, we do this every two years. I'm on the board of the nonprofit organization called TISCA or Triangle Software Quality Association. We love running this. Our objective in life, our objective as an organization is to help testers in this area grow and be better in their careers, learn new skills, all those kinds of things. We have a lot of people join us. We have some great sponsors joining us. Our call for papers has generated over 130 submissions, which is pretty awesome. Um, we're excited to be able to help some people travel this year, but as always, we're going to focus on regional people and helping people here grow, and sometimes that means giving them their first opportunity to speak. TISCA, for me, was my first opportunity to speak at a conference, so I want to make sure to give that back to plenty of other folks as well. So join us in Durham in February. You can find more information at tsqa.org. Like I mentioned, I got my first keynote, woohoo! STPCon in San Diego, and I'm gonna have a discount code for you guys before the conference. So keep your eyes open. San Diego is a wonderful place to go. I can't wait to be there. I'm looking forward to it a ton. It's gonna be a great show, some great speakers already lined up for it, and STP just always puts on a good show. So make sure you're out there and joining us. I'll be doing my Dev Drone Ops workshop, a brand new workshop out there, as well as a keynote and a session talk on ROI. So make sure to join us in March and April of, uh, of this coming year for STPCon. You guys know the B-List. This is the B-List. It's a thank you and a congratulations. Congratulations for making the B-List. These are some folks who did nice things over the last few weeks or few months, some things that were kind or helpful or checked in or said a good word, things like that. So I made sure to try to recognize those people. Um, this company doesn't run with just me. We have wonderful employees. We have wonderful vendors, wonderful people who support us and make things happen and help us support our clients and get test automation running and running smoothly and running effectively for our clients. One other thing, I have a automation engineer role open and it's a remote 
position, but only in the US. We're not sponsoring visas. So make sure to take a snapshot right now of that link at the bottom, beauforfairmont.com slash automation dash engineer. That's where you can go to apply online. I would prefer people from North Carolina, Colorado, Illinois, or Iowa. So make sure to give me a yell about this position. You guys know we do a $50 Amazon card giveaway every single webinar. I was so happy that um, for the winner last time around, I just sent that out. I was really late on getting it to him, but hopefully he'll uh, accept my apology for it being so late. Looking forward to giving that away today. Stick around to the end of the show to make sure that uh, you have a chance to win that. So we are gonna get into Megan's talk here in just a second. But first, I wanna do a couple things as, as we're getting going here. I wanna start with a poll, and I wanna figure out a little bit more about you and a little bit more about what your experience is with leadership. And this will kind of guide our conversation a little bit. And as you're doing this, as you're putting your information in, I'll give you a couple of other pieces of information. As we're going along, if you have a question, there's a place inside your GoToWebinar webpage or control panel where you can type that question in. You can also raise your hand. So there's a list of attendees, a place where you can click to raise your hand. It probably looks like a little hand icon. You can do that as well, but we love it when people type it in or if they just raise their hands. So make sure to contribute and be a part of this. We love to have you joining us and contributing with questions and thoughts for Megan. And we'll have time at the end for those questions to go through it. So I'm gonna close this poll up and I'm gonna share with you what the results were. So what is your experience of leadership? This is what it looked like. You should be able to see those results right now. And the results, it looks like were many folks here, over a third or about a third had many years. In other words, over 10 years of experience in leadership and 64%, so the large majority had five or more years. So that's pretty cool. This is gonna be very interesting to see your thoughts on this. So make sure to present that back to us with the form of questions or in the chat session. One more question here before we get started, just to get another gauge of how, um, of, of who, who it is that's attending and learn more about you, engage the conversation toward you. How many years of testing have you worked? And so you've got zero to five years, six to 10 years, or more than 10. And we've got about 70% of people voting, which is a really good number for us, 75. You guys are great. Wow, we're gonna have everyone here. So I'm gonna close the poll at 85%. That's wonderful, and share the results. So 70% more than 10 years in testing. So that's pretty interesting. We've got some very experienced testers and some very experienced managers or leaders here. So at this point, I'm gonna introduce you to Megan Thompson and I'm gonna put her off of mute and change the screen over to her in just a second here. So Megan is at the company AtView. She's a manager of testing there. And Megan is very active in the test automation, in the testing community. And she wants to bring us information about test leadership and the future of it. So Megan, I'm glad to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm really excited to be here. I was also excited to hear that Tisca is so affordable because that is actually a fantastic conference. Um, it is. Have you been to it before? I haven't. I would love to, but I know some people who are planning some amazing talks for it, so that's exciting. Yeah, we had so much great feedback from uh, this call for papers and call for proposals. It's going to be exciting. We've got a theme called the space of testing this year, and so some folks are going to, to jazz up their talks with space <laughs> stuff, so I'm excited about that. That's but thanks great. for being here, and good luck on this talk. I, I'll talk to you in a little bit um, after you're done. If you need anything, I'm right here. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Let's see. Mm -hmm. I have to get out of my, uh... oh, I've still got a poll on. Let me turn this poll off. Find the results and let's see if we can see it. Not yet, let me change this, try changing this over to you again. Mm-hmm. Thank you all for your uh, your patience here. It looks like you're the presenter. Okay. Can you try um, try unsh and it, it shows that you're sharing that it works. here. I can't see it though. Can somebody give us some? Oh, now I can. Now I've got it. Great. Is that working? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay. So thank you very much again. I'm really excited to share this with everybody. Um, 
this is not just if you have the title of manager or lead or whatever, it's just anybody can be a leader if you have you know, ambition and integrity and honesty. So it's for everybody. So I'll just dive in. Um, almost a year ago now, uh, a company moved to town that they were opening a second office, a very successful startup. Um, and I knew they had no QA team and I was curious about that. So I actually reached out to the director of development who was very kind and gracious and invited me to the office for a tour. And he explained to me how about four years ago, they decided, well, they all gathered in the room and said, how can we be faster? How can we, they're B2C, so they have to beat other people to market. And the thing that came up was um, testing is slow. Um, so that was unfortunate, <laughs> but understandable. And so they looked into how can we change it? What value is, and I'm gonna use QA and testing interchangeably. So forgive me if you have strong feelings about that. But um, <clears throat> so they were concerned and they wanted to know what value are they providing that we couldn't replace? And they couldn't come up with anything. And so that team was either migrated into becoming developers or they left the company. And that was four years ago. And they describe it as an extremely successful decision they made. Um, and I left very sad, obviously, but um, intrigued. And I wanted to know what could this team have done? What can I do to communicate our value better so that nobody ever questions what value we provide? So what I did was reach out to a heck of a lot more <laughs> people in my area who were so kind and so gracious to share their thoughts and their feelings about QA with me. Um, and just they had a lot to say that wasn't easy to hear all the time but i think it's really important that we do listen because obviously these are our stakeholders um so the bottom one there the bottom on the right the qas all wanted to be devs anyway that is from the gentleman i was talking about and again all of these people were very honest and i am so grateful for the good the bad and the ugly because it allowed, it gave me so much research. And so everything in this talk is based on, <clears throat> sorry, uh, what I learned there. So everything that I pulled together from all these conversations is in this talk and, and is the foundation of everything. There are future blogs and talks planned that go more in depth into certain themes that came up, but this is sort of a high level overview of the things I really wanted to share with people because I don't want anyone to, to not be, to not know their value and also to not be communicating their value. So the first thing that comes up is hiring the right people, which is so hard. And when I was at my former company, uh, my first chance to build the QA team I wanted came up and I was so excited and I knew I was looking for three things. The first one was fit. I wanted people who agreed with our methodology, understood our processes, uh, you know, just agreed with what we thought was best um, and would be excited about the initiatives we have in place and how we plan to do them. And the other one was curiosity. Uh, everyone talks about curiosity. Everyone feels that curiosity is important for testers, but I wanted to know how exactly do I find that? And the third one was passion. So I love testing and I love everything about it. I love to read about it. As Paul said, I'm really active as I can be in the Twitter community and uh, I love going to conferences. I love exciting junior testers and bringing them into that sort of stuff. I love it. And I've thought, how cool would it be if we had a whole team of people who were just radiant about testing and loved every bit of it. And so I went looking and I went to Twitter and I asked, how do I find these people? I asked, I tagged some people that I knew had hired and um, some people who might be here now. <laughs> um, and I wanted to know, okay, how do I find these people? Because these people are the masters and they'll know. And what I got in response was very different from what I anticipated. Um, what I got really made me think more about what I was looking for, but more importantly, why I was looking for it. Uh, why was I looking for fit? Why was I looking for passion? What did these really mean? And then there was a double message of, 
the words used for fit, culture, um, and passion, at least in, in my part of the world, uh, have been used historically to exclude others. They've been code words that make certain groups of people feel uncomfortable. And that was never something I wanted to do. Uh, so I thought, oh man, I have to remove fit from, from all sorts of things and find a different way to communicate that. And then passion, this one on the top right by Lorian Tech, um, I thought really resonated with me about passion, how hobby um, becomes burnout. Um, I myself, I would describe myself as pretty passionate about what I do, but I also know that that means I experience heavy burnout <laughs> and I have to be really careful about that. And I think that's really common. And funny enough, what it reminded me of was an interview I saw in the news about 20 years ago that just stuck with me forever. Um, it was this married couple. They were about a hundred years old, both of them, and they've been married for 75 years. And the reporter asked them, what, What's the trick? Well, how did you last 75 years? Everyone wants to know that, right? And so they said something that stuck with me forever. We were, we were patient enough to understand that we will sometimes fall out of love with each other, but we were lucky enough that we didn't do it at the same time. And I thought, wow, that's so amazing. So in a funny way, I tie that into how I wanna build my team when it comes to passion. And that means, the difference between shooting stars and constellations. So shooting stars burn hot and fast. We've all seen them. It's exciting to watch them at work. Um, and then they're gone. <laughs> um, maybe not necessarily gone, but they can't maintain that forever. Um, and then constellations are those steady, reliable, honest, the people you can ground your team in. Uh, just And so now I try to create a mix of both of those when I'm hiring. And it's important to have that mix because we can't all be, you know, bouncing around the room excited about everything. Someone needs to be the calm voice of measure. So um, when I think of fit now, I realized that fit wasn't really a testing mindset. Why are we looking, why are we seeking out confirmation bias when it comes to uh, employees? So I thought, what I really need is people who disagree with me, uh, people with reasoned arguments and, and disagreeing with me and we can engage in discourse and, and maybe they're right. Um, they're probably right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's what I look for now in terms of fit. And if I can't find, if it doesn't come up naturally in an interview, I try to kind of pick a fight a little bit. So not like a real fight, obviously, but, um, I do want to hear them disagree with me and that's exciting because that means we're going to have different ideas and someone who's not afraid and just going to do what I think is best because I'm wrong often. So the last thing, so I was like, okay, no fit, no passion. <laughs> what do I have left? Curiosity. Everyone knows curiosity. So I went looking for ways to identify curiosity in interviews or ways that people show inter uh, curiosity with strangers because interviews are a very unique experience. And what I learned, sadly, was that except for the very privileged, which means different things in different locations or different economic backgrounds, but for the very privileged, curiosity cannot exist in the same space as all of these feelings or situations. So when I look at this list, I know that as someone interviewing for a job, I have felt probably all of these. I myself have autism. Uh, so yeah, I can just understand how everyone is feeling these all the time. And of course, 92% of us do. Everyone, almost everyone gets a little anxious about job interviews. And then there are exacerbating factors that make it even worse for people. And so I thought, how am I going to, how am I going to bring that out, show something that's hiding? Um, how can I get, make people feel like they can express that? Um, in an interview. And so I myself have been a few of these, but the, the only woman in the room, I just, uh, I've been inter interviewed by panels of men. And I really would encourage people to, to think about that <laughs> when they enter the room about how that makes someone feel. Um, so what I wanted to do was find evidence of curiosity, basically be a tester. So 
I look in their resume and I read between the lines. Uh, people have lots of things in their resume and usually we do ask some version of did anything block you or what stood in your way or what was difficult about that and usually we're looking for signs of persistence and persistence is a trait of curiosity so if you look from through it if you look at it from that lens then you can think hmm like if something stood in their way how did they go about finding information that they needed and that is a curiosity trait uh, storytelling is really important because humans only exist because of our ability to interpret, share, and tell stories. It makes us feel comfortable with each other. It exposes our vulnerabilities, which is critical to making people feel comfortable around you. Um, and so um, if we can do that in interviews and not necessarily be the tough one who's trying to get the dirt on them, but rather share our own, we'll probably have a much better outcome. And then finding the struggle. So everyone has a struggle. I myself have tried to hide them in the past. When I was more junior, I would try to hide certain things. Like, for example, I never finished my degree. I was, and I used to, yeah, try to hide that because I thought people would make certain judgments about it. So now I bring it up in, in interviews or conversations where it comes up. I'm, I'm happy to bring it up because I, think that it actually says a lot about me. I was a single mom of three kids at the time between the age of one to 10. And uh, I was doing a 3.9 in my computer science degree. I was doing very well, but I was also cleaning houses on the side, doing anything I could to put food on the table. But I got to a point where I just couldn't anymore and I needed to work. And so I was lucky that I kind of fell into an internship with um, testing and I know a lot of people just fall into testing and luckily some of us fall in love and, and I did. So I was doing all the ISTQB stuff and getting my certification and I thought there must be more and I went looking and I found Michael Bolton and James Bach and Beaufort Fairmont and I just like Janet Gregory, Lisa Crispin, all these people that I was really excited by. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I love this. This is what I want to do. So my struggle could be interpreted as a weakness that I didn't finish. It, you could think I'm someone who doesn't finish what I set out to do. But in truth, it's a story of my own curiosity. It's a story of my own ambition and persistence. And if we can find those and make people feel comfortable enough to share them through our own vulnerabilities, then I think that's a really strong indicator of curiosity. And lastly, what I like to think about is the push versus the pull. So the push is something we've all experienced. Um, Sorry. So it's your parents telling you to eat your vegetables. It's your teacher telling you to hand in your homework. It's your boyfriend or girlfriend telling you it's about time you got married. It's, it's uncomfortable. We don't like it. It's the push. Now, scientists for a long time have tried to identify a curiosity gene. And so far, they're not successful in isolating one. But they do know one thing for sure, we think, <laughs> um, that curiosity is closely linked to dopamine. And dopamine is the happy hormone that we all know and love. The one when you get a Twitter notification or you have chocolate or yeah, just anything, you know, you pass a level in a video game, that flash of happiness and joy and comfort in your mind, that's dopamine. And people who are curious get that same hit from the pursuit of information and the gaining of the information itself. So no outside influence, like a job promotion or a salary increase, or winning a prize, those are external influences. A curious person is the person staying up all night clicking the links because there's more information, they just need to know. And so in interviews, people are often telling me, and I'm sure you too, that they're learning new things. And usually, so in a public talk here, I would say, where I could see you, I would say, what's the one thing that everybody, especially juniors, says they're currently learning? Um, and that, of course, is automation. And usually, they say it with some amount of deadness in their eyes. Uh, <laughs> they, and if you ask anything else about it, they're not really sure, but they just say automation, because that's the one everyone wants to hear, I guess. So <clears throat> that feels more like push. They, it's the one they know they're supposed to say. But if somebody, if their eyes spark, if they light up, if they cannot shut up about it, that's the pull 
That's the excitement and the pull is curiosity. So that's ultimately what I'm looking for people and that I want them to get me excited about whatever it is they're learning. And I don't even care if it's about testing. I want to see that they're excited about learning to cook or learning to sew or learning to drive, whatever. If they can get me excited, that's, that's awesome. So that's what I look for. And once you have these people, what do you do with them? So back to the research. Um, and some people I learned, I've never seen a word cloud. So basically all I did was take all the topics or phrases that came up in all of my interviews, put them into um, a word cloud, which spits them out as the bigger and bolder it is, the more it was talked about, the smaller the opposite. So it's very obvious what these high level decision makers are thinking. Everyone interviewed was a founder or a CTO or a VP um, or a director. So these high level decision makers, this is what they're thinking about. Uh, which is a little bit scary, but we can deal with this and calm down is my favorite and it'll come up later. <laughs> um, but more than anything, what came out of all of this was that we need to be adaptable and we need to be building adaptable teams. We cannot be sticks in the mud. We cannot stick to the way we've always done things. We can't insist on spreadsheets if someone's un if a director is uncomfortable with spreadsheets and wants something different, you know, it's important that we have our own flavor and our own style, but we need to be flexible. So when we're managing teams to be flexible, we will undoubtedly encounter fear. And as leaders, it's, it's so important. It's one of the most important roles of your job to identify fear, to see it coming, identify it and address it. Um, otherwise it grows into a big ugly monster nobody can deal with. So one of the things I like to do is is play worst case scenario, which some people have seen, uh, where you just say the worst thing that can happen. And so the most common thing is I'm gonna get fired. I'm not gonna get a raise if I don't learn this. Uh, the developers are gonna think I'm stupid. Lots of things like that. And so we can address those one-on-one -on -one once we vocalize them, once we say what it is. And I really believe that the antidote to fear is listening. So most people in fear just want to be heard. And if you can be that voice, and share your own stories, that same vulnerability key, they will open up and you can push your team forward and challenge them and, and hopefully excite them about that adaptability that's needed. And so back to the gentleman in the beginning. He, one of the questions I ask everybody, whether they have a testing team or they have eliminated it, is how do you know it's working? Uh, what's, what is your measurement of quality, no matter who's responsible for quality? So, he said the most important thing to them was their speed to release. So uh, in the beginning, when they decided something needed to change, they were releasing, I think it was once a week. Um, it might've been once every two weeks. And so I said, how do you know it's working? And he said, how do you know quality has been achieved? And he said, well, we now release 200 times a day. And I thought instantly my reaction was like, oh, this poor silly man, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know that Speed is not a measurement of quality. You can release anything fast. And it really stuck in my brain just over and over and over. And then it hit me a couple days later that if I accept the accepted definition of quality, then what he's saying is a definition of quality because he's a stakeholder and he matters. And if the director and the founders and the VPs all think that that's what's important, then we need to be listening to that and it, we need to incorporate it into what matters to our team. And so one of the things I like to do is really listen. So uh, when the founders are walking by talking about an angry customer, or when you overhear uh, a conversation with the VPs in the kitchen, where they're talking about uh, something they're concerned about, or in the all hands meetings where the CEO is saying, you know, this didn't go well last time and we really wanna make sure this works this time, or or this client is really concerned about this one specific thing, all of those things should inform your testing and all of those things should be communicated to your team and you should all be on board with what matters to the decision makers in your company. Whether or not you think it's truly a measure of quality or not, it is because it is to them. So the things that they communicated uh, were missing uh, is <laughs> this one, I don't want to offend anyone, <laughs> but, but um, all of these were hard for me too sometimes. So 
uh, they don't care about testing activities in themselves. They were very clear about that. I don't care about your spreadsheet. I don't care about the red green. I don't care about the percents. I just wanna know the results overall. I wanna know how all of that fed into the information you can give me about our goals. And recurring issues and support is important. Don't, they would say things like, this is the calm down part. Don't run around like a chicken with your head cut off because one customer is angry in support. You're so much better to find patterns, look for causes, look for procedural things we did that caused a pattern of issues to occur. That's valuable information. Client retention, some people don't view it as a part of their job. It absolutely is to all of them. They all said some version of client retention. And why do they expect me to fight for them when they won't fight for themselves? Um, this this is from a gentleman whose conversation I enjoyed so much, I now work for him. Uh, so, um, and I really appreciated this because I think a lot of testers are waiting to be asked, are waiting to be invited into meetings where they should just say, I'm coming, I need to know this information, share it with me. Um, at, at any level, really, I mean, obviously there are some rooms we can't enter, but you know, in general, stop waiting to be asked. Um, and I guess now would be a good time for you to start writing your questions out if you have them. Um, so what they said was how we can be the most valuable. Uh, data obsession. They want to hear um, hard data that matters to the business. Uh, not it's slower, but it's 15% slower since we implemented this feature or we updated Java and every and this specific thing is broken or you know data not anecdotal evidence uh, domain knowledge this was something that was identified as a weakness by almost every single person who was close to development so directors of development that kind of area um, they all felt that testers I shouldn't say all but the ones who identified it felt that testers often get into a panic or block releases or really push hard on things that if they had better domain knowledge, they would feel less like customers would do that. So being the guru on the user, knowing as much as you can, soaking up their world. So in my case, that's the music industry now. So I have to go learn all about festivals and touring and merchandise sales at concerts um, and get as much information as I can about that so that I can say, that does look bad, but our users either would not care about that because that does happen sometimes, or they just wouldn't do that. Or if they did, they'd be like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, and then the company historian. This one is honestly gold. If you can be the person that the CEO comes to and asks, what happened last time we did this? Or what went wrong? Do you remember two years ago when we tried this feature and it totally failed? We're gonna try it again. Do you remember what went wrong? If you can become that person, that wealth of information, you're, you're just invaluable to your company. So, and this um, was something I, I recently gave this talk in Ireland and I forgot to <laughs> mention something key. So I have to thank James for making me add this slide so I don't forget. Everything we communicate needs to be through the lens of business impact. If we are communicating outside of the QA and possibly outside of the dev team, then we need to be speaking in terms of business impact. We need to speak to the bottom line. That is critical. So that all of that information about, you know, the patterns of things that are occurring should be, and this is how it affects our bottom line. And this is how many users are affected by this feature. And this is how many users we could lose. This is how many we lost last month. You know, that matters to the business. We all care about our users. We all love our users. We all wanna do the best work we can. Hopefully some of us love our jobs, but ultimately we're there because it's a business and we need to keep that in mind. So that means when we communicate thre threats and risks, it needs to be through that lens, but also we need to brag on our teams. I feel like testers, sit back and let other people take the glory. And often, I mean, how many times has it happened where you thought we should add this or this feature is gonna be useless or, oh, this is really bad. Like 
let's fix this. And everyone agrees, yeah, you're right, we should fix this and we do. And then there's some glowing customer success story. And everyone thanks, you know, the developers, the product managers, UX, and the testers just sit there silently. We need to be communicating our impact on the business and positively so that again, we don't become that team where the board members sit in the room and say, what was their point again? Why did we hire those people? And if you don't remember anything else from this talk, please remember this section. I think this was the most important thing. So <clears throat> I think if you look at these images, oh, the Grim Reaper and the sandwich board guy. Um, <laughs> if you look at these images, I think we can all remember times where either we or members of our team probably looked like this to the, the team at large, um, meaning outside of testing. And so we have a tendency to be the harbinger of doom. And how we communicate that is really important. And, and too many times we come off as outsiders. We come off as people who are pointing from outside the problem. And that does not really get us invited into those circles of conversation where we could be so valuable and where we could feel so rewarded. So what I like to think of for myself is Paul Revere. You know, as I said, I recently gave this talk in Europe and nobody in the room knew who Paul Revere was, which makes perfect sense. Um, so I will try as a Canadian to explain an American hero um, my best. Paul could probably do a lot better job. But Paul Revere, so on the eve of the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which I believe is the first battle in the American Revolutionary War, um, they didn't have an army, they just had a militia. So these were people that were asleep in their homes miles and miles apart from each other. And um, so on the eve of the battle, they knew the Redcoats were coming and Paul Revere volunteered to, I guess, stay up and watch for the watchman to light the lanterns. And then he said, when you light the lanterns, I will go alert the militia. Um, now, a fair bit of this is romanticized through the poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. <laughs> and it turns out there were many others who did the same thing, but you know, it suits my purposes. So <laughs> we're going with the poem. So um, Paul Revere waited, the lanterns were lit, the redcoats were coming by sea, and he rode across the countryside, waking everybody up. He's famously misquoted as saying, the British are coming, the British are coming, but everyone at that time would have been British, so apparently it's actually the redcoats are coming, the redcoats are coming. And waking everybody up and bringing them to him, bringing them to battle. Now, the message he was communicating was probably terrifying, and it definitely qualifies as doom. King George's army had ships and huge cannons. I probably, I don't actually know that. <laughs> Guns and um, they were certainly outgunned and they were probably outnumbered. Um, so the message he was bringing was not an easy one to bring. And the people who received it were probably terrified out of their wits. But he's seen as a hero, I believe, because even though he's still a harbinger of kind of doom, um, he brings it as one of them and he doesn't run through the countryside screaming, we're all gonna die, we're all gonna die. He says the red coats are coming and it's a call to action. He's saying, come on, let's go, let's respond to this. So Paul Revere is my, I don't know, my, I guess, example to myself, the person I think of when I think of how to communicate what we're truly scared of as a team uh, to, the, to the rest of the company so that we don't look like the sandwich board guy, but rather the hero who in the poem is described as a voice in the darkness. And I really want to build teams and to have other people build teams who their companies think of as a voice in the darkness. I mean, that's awesome, right? rather than the crazy guy in the corner who's mad all the time, which was literally said to me. <laughs> so um, thank you, that's all I have. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. That I, I tweeted already that I think this is my favorite webinar that we've ever done on here. 
Well, thank you. So thank you so much for doing this. And I'll tell you all, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to have Megan on here. I didn't know her very well. <laughs> I'd never seen one of her talks. But I think a big part of why I wanted to have you on, Megan, was because I saw you on Twitter asking questions and being curious. And just, I didn't even think about it, but just instinctively it made sense. And to see people who are out there trying to learn and trying to gain something out of the world around them and give something back at the same time is inspiring, whether it's passion that drives that or not. So uh, thank you so much for, for doing that. And while we're getting a few questions in here, you all are welcome, or, or just comments. Here's one that says, excellent job. I loved all the info. And I thought it was hilarious when you said Paul Revere didn't run through the field or, or try, go down the, the trail shouting, we're all going to die, we're all going to die. What a different story that would be, right? What yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for not putting me on, on the spot for American history. I appreciate it. <laughs> so there's a little bit of my um, vulnerability there. Um, but uh, yeah, so folks are typing their questions and their thoughts right now as we're going through this. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned, I just want to comment on really quickly. You mentioned about the business impact and to state things in terms of business impact as testers. And I was just talking with my wife about this last night. I can't tell you how many groups of testers I've sat down with and talked with and asked about their product and said, what does your product do? And they start pointing me through all the features and the functions and what it can do and where you click on this and what you do over there. But they don't necessarily give me the business impact. What is it that this does for your customers, for your partners, for whoever this is developed for? What is it doing for your users? How is it impacting their business? How is it impacting yours? And if our job has something to do with mitigating risk as testers, then how can we assess risk without knowing the business impact of what we do. How, if we don't know our business and our domain, how would we ever assess risk? So, um, and assessing risk may not even be our job. It may just be reporting on it, but some folks include that in their definition. So I wanted to bring that out. Um, a couple of the comments here as we're going through, and if you'll, I'm gonna take the screen back from here, from you for just a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, so this says, yes, really loved this seminar, says uh, Tetsinda. Um, Mike says exceptionally, and I, I've got my, uh, there we go. I couldn't get my clicker back. Exceptionally <laughs> presented, really brings out some thoughts in the foreground, says Mike. Thank you so much for this. So if folks are typing in a few more questions, they're more than welcome to. Was there anything else you wanted to add as we're as we're kind of waiting here for folks to make some comments? Um, you said it all, right? I guess I, I guess I didn't give enough time to type. No, you <laughs> gave plenty of time. It, maybe you answered all their questions. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, thank you very much. I, it is, it's been really exciting to do this research and to talk to all these people and to gain hard things to hear. And so it's been so nice to share it with people because they really want to help. It's tough, isn't it? But the, the room for growth, I think, only comes when you get uncomfortable. Yeah, that's a really good point. Do you think that's true? I mean, it, seem, it seems like you got pretty uncomfortable in these questions and the answers. Yeah, yeah, they were, I mean, that first one, when we talked about the team that had left, I almost cried when I left the office. I felt so doomed about my career and my future. <laughs> and yeah. Then, yeah. So that was hard. Yeah. And I, I, you know what the thing is, you got to get, I mean, as you know, I, I see, I see a lot of folks who get uncomfortable and they run away from whatever it is. And that's one way to handle things, avoidance. We can do that. But the only way you're going to grow is if you dig down into whatever that thing is that made you want to cry. Why did yeah. it make me want to cry? Why did I experience that emotion? Why did I respond to it that way or react that way? As opposed to what did the other person do to me, right? Yeah, that's How so did good. I experience that? What can I do with it? And it seems like that's what you're doing, which is so important. Um, here, we're getting a few, a few comments here. So um, Rich says, uh, excellent. It seems like there is more QA elimination over DevOps automation. Um, mm. what, what do you hear about that? I mean, so yeah, and I, I've had some people on my teams ask me about this. I think that I think that testers actually have a huge role to play in DevOps. I think learning automation is a great path if that's if that's the path you want to take. But there's also, I mean, if you can help developers um, with the quality of their tests that they're writing, that's awesome. And I know that's how um, Microsoft is doing it a little bit, right? And um, so I think that there's always a role. I think. I'm not sure about the giant test team scenario anymore. Yeah, I, I don't really know about that, but I think I think there's always a role. Did that answer my question? 
I think so, yeah. Um, I have one here from Martha, and Martha says, what is the value of 2,000 release or 200 releases per day? What's the benefit or risk of it? Do you have any thoughts about that? So the value to them is beating other competitors to market. Um, and actually, there was one really cool thing he told me about. They host a conference uh, once a year during in which they have a lab where clients, they you know, it's one of those like corporate conferences where they only invite their clients and tell them about new features and exciting things. And they have a lab there where users can play with new features. And the UX team is in the lab, listening to them and interacting with them and sending immediate feedback back to the office here. And then the next day in the conference, they'll say, we heard you, we released this feature overnight. And that's amazing customer feedback, right? That makes customers feel so worthy. And so, I mean, that's, I imagine that's their, that's their goal is beating people to market and, and delivering fast. Gotcha. The yeah. Risk, and the risk is, I mean, obviously like it's bugs, right? So. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just mention uh, the Accelerate book is wonderful for talking through this. Basically one part of it, as there are many pieces of it that in my experience, if you don't mind me adding on a little bit here. No. Um, one part of it is if you have the ability to deploy 200 times a day, it means that you're good at deploying. And if you get good at deploying, it's easier to find defects. Um, but so many companies are not good at deploying. Um, and it causes huge problems. If it's something you only do every six months, how can you ever get good at it? And then many of the problems we find are because of the deployment process rather than because of the actual application. Um, there, there's a lot more thinking uh, in that, but the Accelerate book and also the Phoenix book um, are very good at that, the Phoenix project. How do you have any advice, or do you have any advice? This is from Anna. Do you have any advice on how to incorporate metrics where none are tracked or they are hidden because there has never been a positive presentation of them. I love the not bug count, but percentage. How is that done? Hmm, that's a tough one. Would you like me to read it again? It was long. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, do you have any advice on how to incorporate metrics where none are tracked or they are hidden because of they've never been shown in a pro positive light I love the not bug count, but percent, but how is that done? I mean, hiding metrics, that's sad. Um, oh, that's, that's a tough one. I don't really, I don't really know. Do you have any ideas, Paul? You know, this is your show. I just realized that I was commenting on your show <laughs> just a minute ago and I probably need to hold back and not do that. Um, yeah, I'll leave it to you. Do, you. do you have any any thoughts about that? Have you seen places where people didn't share metrics and thought of a way that maybe they could do it differently? So. I, yeah, I mean, there's there's metrics that people downplay. I've never really seen them hidden, um, but I I would stress that there's probably a positive way to to change that, not change the metrics, obviously, but um, to communicate them a little a little bit better. And it's not that we always have to be like sunshine and rainbows. It's just if you can if you can communicate those in terms of business risk and show that you're on on the same side. So that we're all in the same team and that you care about this, not because you want to be the first to identify it, but because you want the same things they do. It's a different result, right? It's heard differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And Beth, uh, Beth has something to say here uh, relevant to that last question. Instead of sharing bug counts as a metric, should we instead share the impact on the business from those defects? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. For sure. Yeah, and actually Nancy gets into this a little bit if it's the talk I'm thinking of that she's going to do next month. Uh, Nancy Kellen gets into this and kind of talks about it and she actually looks at um, different ways of showing the metrics that may be easier or funnier to think about than just straight dry numbers. So oh, make sure awesome. to tune in for that as well. And I love her, so everyone should definitely. She's from this <laughs> my town too. So. Oh, two from Calgary at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, right, right back to back like that. Wow, okay. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, and let's see, so this is a, a comment from Akash, and Akash, I'm sorry I didn't get to your, your hand raise here. Um, leaders are more interested in what the data means rather than the numbers. We need to make sure that's what's communicated. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. That's a good point. I think that's a good point. Cool. That's about all we've got. There might be one more here. Um, I track metrics on production defects and those that are shared with the board. And those are shared with the board. So this uh, Brian actually has things shared with his board That's for good. production. That's interesting. 
Cool. Well, this is great. Any other comments you want to you want to make? I, I hope folks will stay around for the Amazon gift card giveaway here in just a minute. And one other thing, um, I'll mention here as we uh, as we close out. Any other thoughts here? Um, no. Just if anyone has anything they want to continue talking about, I'm on Twitter, um, and I, I love all the feedback. It's it's great to to learn and grow. So I'm a relatively I'm a very new speaker. So <laughs> can you give us your Twitter handle uh, once yes. again? I am at one startup tester. Let me see if I can. Oh, I can't show it again, but yeah. At one startup tester. Perfect. Perfect. There were a couple more comments here. Look, stay tuned after this. So I'm doing a survey. I'm trying to be curious about a number of things. So after this, when you close down your portal, whether it's through the web or through a go to webinar control panel, we have a few minutes left. If you would take the survey that I have there, it would really help me learn and grow and help us provide more for you that you like, and it'll also help us provide, uh, hopefully, services that continue to thrill our customers. So make sure to take that survey afterwards. If you don't see it today, it will be in the email that comes to you after this. So let's see who's gonna win the gift card. Are you ready, Megan? I am ready. I'm ready. <laughs> and the winner is Ashley W. So Ashley, congratulations on winning the $50 Amazon gift card today. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate each one of you being here. When you're ready to talk, whether it's test automation leadership, DevOps, automation in general, when you're ready to pursue those within your team, give us a call at Beaufort Fairmont. Our number is here. It is country code 1-984-244-2313. And you have my contact information there as well. I'm always interested in talking with companies who are moving toward automation making changes in automation, have problems to solve related to that or deployment, and, uh, and we're always happy to help. So if we didn't get to your question, we may be able to follow up with those a little bit offline. Thank you so much again for being here, and please take a moment to take the survey after this. It's only five questions. Once again, thank you, Megan, and we look forward to seeing everybody on the 18th for the last webinar of the year. So thank you very much, and everyone have a nice day. Thank you.